And so we're honored to have such a wonderful little esteemed panel with us today. Oh my goodness, each one could be a keynote speaker within themselves. And so I was, uh, we have two community-based organizations with us and then representatives of the MMC and North Carolina Central. So I will just start on this, and this is Marissa Chirinos, and she uh, she works for El Centro Hispanico, which is a community-based organization that works to strengthen the community to build bridges and serves as an advocate for equity and inclusion of Hispanics and Latinos in the Triangle area of um, North Carolina. She's um, been working at El Centro Hispanico since 2000 as an HIV educator on uh, educator on prevention of chronic diseases like STDs and HIV obesity and diabetes, breast cancer, and strokes. And she currently works as a personal navigator for Latino men and Latino transgender, transgender women who are HIV positive um, with the UNC project um, called uh, As Well as Pool of Sod. Did I say that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and she has a medical and anesthesiology degree from the University of Central de la Venezuela. And then Dr. Livingston was at the end, and I'm just following along in your program. I'll just give brief bio introductions of everyone. Dr. Jonathan Livingston is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at North Carolina Central University. Uh, he received his doctorate in community psychology, and prior to attending Michigan State, he received training in African and African American study, African American sociology at Florida A&M. Um, his areas of interest are African African American psychological well-being and the cumulative effects of racism and social inequalities on African American mental health and health disparities. And then beside him, you know, we have Ms. Laquan Palmer, who is an MPA. She serves as a capacity builder, as a specialist for the juvenile justice system, and older youth specialist for young adults 18 to 19 at the age of, um, at um, the Sexual Health Initiative for Teens, uh, she in North Carolina. We have so many of her colleagues here today. Thank you all for visiting. Um, and joining us today. Prior to joining SHIP, um, she provided HIV and STD prevention services with the Wake County um, Services Department of Public Health, and that's how we know each other. She received her Bachelor of Public Health Education at the University of North Carolina um, at UNCG and Master of Public Administration from North Carolina Central, and she also has a Certificate of Public Health Leadership from UNC. And then last, we have Dr. Wisdom Powell, who we're so delighted to, to have. Um, it's a <coughs> professor of the Department of uh, Health Behavior at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Dr. Powell is trained in health population health disparities research. She's a clinical psychologist and associate professor of the Department of Health Behavior. She is re recognized nationally for, for her impact, for the impact of her work addressing social determinants of health uh, inequalities among boys and men of color, resolving the widely acclaimed gender so we're just honored to have each of our panelists today, and they're each going to talk some about their work uh, around social determinants of health. We'll open up and have questions, so it's really just to engage you. So please um, take those as questions, and I will start. I know nobody wants. To, I know Dr. Lipson not going to want me to go, but anybody wants to be my one person. Whoever, you, however you all want to do, I don't have to. <laughs> okay, I didn't mean to do that. But thank you all for coming and serving on the panel today. So looking forward to it. I'm just. Um, it's a wonderful dialogue and conversation. Welcome. Well, I'll start. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to be here and also um, to be in um, good company with my dear friend, Shonda Ford, um, and to talk with you a little bit about my work and hopefully um, looking forward mainly to the discussion that will take place afterwards. I am, as the introduction um, noted, I'm a clinical psychologist, but I a dual training in public health, and it was an intentional path because I was very interested in understanding um, a lot of what has already been discussed, but what I described as fundamental or root causes of black male health inequities across the life course. It became very clear to me that um, even though we see a narrowing of the sex um, differences gap in life expectancy, that black males continue to live the shortest lives of all men in our country. And we know that those data aren't linked to, you know, purely biological phenomena. Because if that were true, then we see similar patterns of disparities across all men, and that's just not the case. So I've been really focused on trying to understand this fundamental cause, root cause, and a question undergirding that is why is it that black males live shorter lives than others? And there are two um, fundamental root causes that sort of are at the center of my work, and that's exposure to racism 
and also masculinity is both uh, not as you think of them as trait disposition, but as social constructions. Really trying to understand what is it that men are told about how they should manage and handle their health, and how does that precipitate um, disparities or inequities in, in health outcomes. The kinds of outcomes that I explore include healthcare services utilization, um, depressive symptomatology, and health risk taking. I use a variety <coughs> of methodological approaches because, as Chandra <coughs> pointed out, um, these are wicked problems and require sort of a multi level, um, multi method approach in order to uncover them and to intervene upon them. So, my met methodologies include survey research, ecological momentary assessment techniques, biological or bi biosocial research, and also uh, survey methods. We do a lot of phenomenological exploration in my research lab at UNC because we also want to center the voices of black men and boys and the stories that we tell about them. So I call myself as sort of um, a disruptor. So dis I like to disrupt single stories about race, about masculinities, about the health, well-being, and potential of young boys and men of color because I believe that part of our goal as a nation is to become more um, economically competitive in a global marketplace. And the workforce, the central workforce of our country will be young men and, and boys of color. I mean, we are a browning nation. We're in the midst of one of our most significant demographic transitions. And so my work really tries to understand, you know, how can we capitalize on that labor force and also look at the potentialities of black men with a different, more socially productive and health protective, positive psychological lens. So I'll stop. Well, I can say as shift and see um, my work there as a capacity building specialist, um, shift we're currently uh, expanding our scope instead of um, formerly we were known as the Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention Campaign in North Carolina. And um, we've now expanded to now we shift and see. And now with that shift in our focus, we are now looking at not only just pregnancy prevention, we're looking at, we're looking at HIV, STIs, um, development, access to care. So with that expansion, me specifically working with juvenile justice, um, it's important for us to you know, look at those young people that are in now linking into that prison pipeline. And as we look at that prison pipeline, what are the things that we uh, could put in place as they are being educated by contraceptive uh, methods, if they are being um, introduced to uh, testing for HIV and STI services, what do those things look like and how can we bridge that gap to making sure that we are making sure they are utilizing these things? So you know that is where you know, my focus is, and hopefully you know continue with shift in their expansion. We will continue to look at those things because my background is from North Carolina Central University, and also at UNC, I have merged the worlds of looking at systems and also merging public health. So as we begin to look at those things, working with you all that is in the room, you know how are we going to be able to do those things to you know, expand it together? Uh, good morning, my name is Maritza Chirinos and I have been working at the St. Louis Park for the last 16 years. So as an immigrant, um, I can understand where the, the challenge that uh, the community face when they come to the United States. Uh, we are people from different backgrounds and um, we left behind a lot of things. We left a family, we left um, our support network. Um, we immigrate from different uh, backgrounds at different time, uh, time of our lives. So some of them we immigrate with our, uh, our family, our close family. But the uh, common denominator is we try to um, adapt to a total uh, different environment. And we face, uh, the first thing is the language barriers. And depending on where we are located, we are really, really isolated from everybody. So um, as um, our organization um, trying to do more connection and um, be the bridge between the community and the organization that work for the, for the Latino community, um, we try to engage our community in different programs. So, um, I have been working uh, in many uh, health issues, and I didn't know that I have, like health here. Uh, but I try to be true to do my best uh, using my background 
Uh, the first thing that we try to do is explain to people how the health system works here. Because it's really, really, really different from our uh, countries. Uh, we used to have like a relationship between um, the doctor or the healthcare provider with uh, the patient. It's something that is really hard to um, have here. So um, we try to educate um, the people how the health system works here. And, and to be more productive and use more the time that they have with the physician. Um, and also uh, the best way that we try to uh, educate the community is through the lay head educator, promotors, or health advisors. Uh, because uh, we reach the community in some point, but we still don't reach the, the community that is really, really isolated. That is the one that we want to reach. So the community health workers, uh, the promoters are the, the, the great tool that we have to reach that community that they can come to our office and we can serve them. So we have different programs. We have uh, the health program, we have the education program, we have community organizing program, and we have the support services um, our, um, our office that is like a reception area when we receive all the concerns and the things that are uh, happening in the community. So um, we provide some um, free clinic, um, legal clinic for, for the community and, and also uh, through education is uh, the thing that we try to uh, um, improve the condition of the community uh, in um, our area. Also we have another branch uh, in Carboro area and Chapel Hill. Uh, so that is the way that we try to reach more. I guess I will go last. Um, <laughs> listen, everyone, I'm trying to figure out how do I get here. Uh, by training, I'm <laughs> by training, I'm a psychologist, uh, and by training, I'm a researcher and quantitative researcher. So this road through health disparities is a pretty peculiar one. Uh, in my last year in grad school, I was asked to help a researcher out in the school of medicine. And they wanted to look at why, what were the barriers to women seeking services for breast cancer, black women. And I remember them sending me the data. And every time they sent me the data, I said it never came through. It was just a bunch of words, because I was trained as a quantitative researcher. I wasn't trained as a quantitative, so I would send it back to them. It's not even there. It was like, that's the data, John. This place is interesting. You tell me we can make. Uh, we do research, we're just listening to people, interviews, and focus groups, and it's really I was fascinating. So when I got to Central, uh, Central, as they begin to move toward biomedicine, biotechnology, we also have a strong tradition of liberal arts. And that strong tradition was expressed in theater. And they wanted to get the folks in theater, we call it soft sciences, not disparaging, and the folks in hard science, biomedicine, and biology work together. So they figured I was the guinea pig. You get community psychologists, they like the community, they get along with everybody. And so we came with this idea of we can address health disparities by using theater. Now, I train, I know nothing about theater, but I learned very quick. Uh, we went out to a grant, P20 grant for about five million, of which 980,000 was for theater. Um, we addressed during that time, our goal was that could we use theater as an effective tool to educate African Americans about health disparities and increase the likelihood that they will be screened. Because I'm a community psychologist prevention, that sounds great to me. Our first play we did was Tones, and it was on substance abuse. Uh, our second play was Ceiling Clouds, which won awards for making incredible actors. These were students from the community. And what we saw after that breast cancer piece was that we saw an increase in screening at Lincoln Health Center. We saw an increase in immediate attachment areas. We said, okay, we're on to something. Then we did plays on prostate cancer, which was always difficult. Getting men to come out to a play on prostate cancer, <laughs> it, was, it was a job. Um, but over that time period, that five to seven year period, I did more learning than anything. I realized, one, that the way most of us, particularly those of us who were trained in empirical methods, particularly those of us who were trained in quantitative research, we may be clueless. 
And if we really want to understand this issue of health disparities, we have to get out and meet people. When I get out and meet people, we got to get out and shake hands, we got to kiss babies, we got to listen to people's lived experiences. Uh, the learning I did from over that period, we published a number of articles and theses on this, um, was that people, know, they know a bit more than we think about the disease. Moreover, the barriers, there's so many barriers around prostate cancer, breast cancer, HIV AIDS that prevent people from going to seek services. And what I learned is, is that it's going to take a multidisciplinary approach. That we, we had to use folks from theater to create the experience, the intervention. We had to use folks from biomedicine, biotechnology, biologists, uh, uh, immunologists. We had to use a number of people to help make this thing make sense because we wanted to edutain. We not only wanted to give them a piece of theater that would make them feel good, but we wanted to educate them at every point about testing, about screening, you know, what's the, what's the trajectory of this disease. Again, the outcomes of 5,000 people came to the play. We have data on about 2,500. We published a number of articles on it. We were able to increase knowledge about HIV, heart disease, prostate cancer, breast cancer. We were able to increase screening. But the strength of this is that we were able to also connect community organizations who came to campus to actually screen people and talk to them about the disease. And that kind of you know, ecological approach, that kind of community approach was amazing. Uh, it's something that I would love to do again as we tackle some of these other problems among African Americans. That's kind of a bit in a nutshell the kind of work uh, I did in health disparities. Does anyone have any questions for us? Specifically for the work that you know we're doing now in your mind our critics? Mm -hmm. I guess um, if you could talk about some of those barriers that we're in specifically, um, uh, if, you, uh, if you could talk specifically about some of those barriers that men face um, in getting into that care, I guess we'll, we'll just start there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the barriers, thank you for your question, yeah. are layered. Um, and I think what I was alluding to in my introduction about the need to disrupt that single story about what prevents men from getting seen um, is especially important in this space because the single story would have you believe that mass men who hold um, strongly, you know, or have rigid assumptions about masculinity are less likely to seek health care. Right? That's the single story, the simple story, part of the story, not the whole story, um, but the more complex story. Um, would suggest that masculinity is very in situ, right? So mm -hmm. situation to situation, moment by moment, um, and also according to cohort, um, you know, when you were born, what the norms were for your generation, according to um, the, the immediate, um, you know, ecological threats to your humanity that are present. So we found in our research that you know men were exposed to more frequent, persistent everyday racism were more, more likely to believe or expect that that racism will follow them into a healthcare setting. That's a really logical, <laughs> rational explanation or, or assumption. And so um, what that taught us was that, you know, men's barriers, black men's barriers to healthcare, um, healthcare seeking are not necessarily linked to one single historical event, like the events in Tuskegee, for example. That in fact, you know, like other developing, growing, evolving human beings, Black men's assumptions about healthcare um, also evolve, and that when presented um, with healthcare that is patient-centered, that uh, where they feel respected and valued, um, all can override um, beliefs about medical um, mistrust, um, and can often lead men to seek care. We have found that in situations where discrimination and masculinity intersect, like or interact, like where you have a high exposure to discrimination and high, um, you know, more rigid um, adherence or incorporation of masculinity that you are less likely to seek care. But the stories need to be, again, situated within, within context. I do believe that, um, you know, men and boys are socialized to believe certain things about what it means to be a male, particularly around emotion disclosure 
and around affiliated bonds, which are required in a healthcare situation. You can't get more vulnerable than when you're in that backless gap, right? So if you're walking into a healthcare setting and that vulnerability is already present, that if you have those norms and you have a situation where implicit bias is running rampant, if you're even if at a deep subconscious level, you're gonna not you're gonna sense something about that environment that will lead you to either disengage um, in the healthcare you know um, interaction where you don't disclose all your symptoms or you know, that pain you had last week you don't tell them about, or you know you need to get your prostate um, checked, but you won't because in that situation, you know, all those things arise. So I think I've been more interested in trying to understand how those things evolve in the moment. And so one of the techniques that we use to explore that is ecological momentary assessment, which for those who are not familiar is like a digital diary, um, real-time assessment technique where you're able to get at what people are feeling in the moment um, and measure that and measure response to those exposures in the moment and then determine, you know, where the points of intervention would make the most sense. Is it to intervene at the moment of affect, um, the, the moment of affect regulation, at the moment of stress arousal? Like, what, what point in that dynamic do we inter intervene? But there are some good news stories, too, because there are ways that we can leverage those norms around masculinity to improve men's health because we've had some contradictory findings. Like in a study that we published in the journal General Internal Medicine, we found that men who actually have more rigid assumptions about being self-determined were less likely to delay preventive screenings. And that's above and beyond insurance status, usual source of care, uh, ethnic um, <coughs> level of education. So in other words, we can leverage those norms and present the healthcare encounter or healthcare seeking as an opportunity to demonstrate your capacity to be a man about your Right. So there are ways you can leverage those norms, and that's why it's important that that story, that single story, that we disrupted and try to understand when and where masculinity enters and when and where it becomes a barrier or an opportunity um, to preserve the health of men and boys. That was a long answer. No, but that's exactly what I was saying. I was raising the salary. Right. Right. So there's all that means more. So I, I, I want to add something. It's not too much different between Latinos and uh, African American and other. Uh, the one thing that we see is uh, men don't have, don't have a, you know access to hair place where they can go. So they usually work between Monday to Saturdays, mm -hmm. and it's because they don't know they don't have to go to the doctor. It's because they can allow to lose one day to visit to the doctor. So if they if they if we uh, have more places where they can go like uh, after hours clinic or maybe weekends. Uh, we can engage more male to uh, looking for um, um, medical assistance. Uh, because if you see, usually they just go directly to the emergency room uh, because it's the only place that uh, find open during the weekends. Um, most of the Latino men are working in the labor the construction labor. So this is a totally different health problem that they are facing <coughs> because sometimes they don't receive the enough information on how to, to, care, to care of them or, or be more uh, preventing of falls <coughs> and, and things like that. So it's, I think it's more the places that they, they need to go. So. Um, Actually, I'm working with HIV positive male, and one of the challenges that they have is they are traveling for all around the states. So they one 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 month are in Ohio, the other month are in Atlanta. So try to engage them to continue his HIV treatment is really hard. Um, I have a, a person I don't like to call client that he is a single dad. He has four children and he say, I can allow to me to go to the doctor during the week because I, I also have to take care of my kids. So I can, I can continue to uh, ask him permission to go to the doctor for me if I have to go for my kids. So that is the thing that uh, maybe we have to think about. And to add on to that, when we did the prostate cancer play, one of the things that we 
do was to go around to prostate cancer support groups and also men's uh, health ministries, churches that were having. And those kind of conversations would come up about fears. And you'd be surprised the fears that Southern men had about you know, prostate cancer, uh, digital record exam. Mm -hmm. Many didn't know that there was an alternative PSA exam. Moreover, when, once you start to listen to their stories, you have to not only unpack lack of knowledge about alternative treatment for prostate cancer, you have to unpack this issue of virility, you have to unpack this issue of uh, sexuality, and it was just it was so clustered and nested, and you look into it, and all these things were barriers. You know, one, I don't want to do that exam, doctor. Number two, uh, I don't want to not be able to perform. <laughs> okay, wow. <laughs> when we begin to place that conversation into the context of you need to get screened because you want to be here for your daughters. You want to be here for that wedding. You want to be able to walk her down the aisle. Then the barriers start to break. Then we begin to talk about, well, what are some effective ways to encourage men to go? And these are men 40 to 70 years of age. And we know they say screening at 50 for uh, most men, African-American men, I think it was the year 35, 40. Now, when we unpacked it like that, we begin to come up with solutions. Solutions among Southern men, which we know are at the highest risk. One, going as teams. Using the kinkeeper model. And that I'm going to take my uncle, I'm going to take my brother, and we all going. We may go shoot pool and watch the game like that, but we're going to go do this and get this up. <laughs> and we're going to masculinely bond out of that. You know? Other alternatives were we're going to take, you know, our significant other with us. You know, take, take a significant other with you. And so we begin to come up with real solutions about how to do it. What were the recommendations for getting men to go? The pressure from the doors. Papa, you, you need to go, Papa. I want you to go. I love you. And, and when you saw the man's face, I said, that would work. <laughs> and so I, I think we, we have to listen to what men are saying, provide them a context where they're able to talk about this issue without that veil of silence, secrecy, uh, and misunderstanding associated with prostate cancer. Because right now, where are we at now? Prostate cancer kills the black men and the police and black men. Okay? Um, as North Carolina researchers and practitioners, I know um, you're familiar with the um, recent um, H2 bill that has gotten the national um, attention and local. And um, it seems interesting to see how, you know, that type of political pressure can affect, you know, although, you know, it's so problematic, a softening of that. So just an example of, you know, what uh, political pressure can do to affect these types of policies. And so um, I'm wondering, if, is there... Um, a state or local bill that um, you feel impacts the disparities of um, the work that all of you are doing? Because I think part of it is, um, you know, just the knowledge of these types of policies and how they can affect these disparities. And then um, also thinking back to, I guess it goes back and forth to um, Dr. Ford's last challenge, you know, you know, we have all of this data, but you know, how do we change the difference? And I think, you know, part of it's like, okay, there's this data, but then gathering the social movement around. So I'm just thinking of like what types of things should we be looking for, um, types of policies. And I know there are probably several for all of them, but um, what would be the top policy you think that contributes to the disparities that um, we should be working with? For me, well, yeah. I'll say for me, it's the Healthy Youth Act. And if you look at that Healthy Youth Act and how it's affecting our school systems across the state, that is a you know a great example of how we can have a, a policy a law that's in place that says that for each school system they are to have reproductive safety you know uh, education in each you know classroom. However, it's up to the principal or the school system uh, school board to decide exactly what is taught. So you know when you take things like that and you look at how you know individuals are going to be educated across the state, that's a prime example of you know. Why it's important to make sure we all vote, number one. <laughs> number two, to you know, look at exactly you know, how you, as you know, an educator, a policymaker, are you going to be able to help you know, with making sure those things are going to be put in place? Because again, if you have a specific principal or if you have a, you know, a board member who is not for you know, giving comprehensive education, not only wants to be you know, access only, there's going to be some issues there. Well, I was just thinking that, and I, I, I actually, I had some, some immediate need for your um, expertise, but uh, I was thinking as you were talking about how
how we're often educated around policy and policy translation in the field of public health. So I'm going to talk about this from a, sort of a more microscopic lens about policy-related work that I'm doing, but also just sort of this general need um, to move more rapidly from the evidence base to, trans to translating that to policy mm -hmm. to action. And you know, it takes us way too long to make that shift, and we're often not educated to do that work unless you're in a program where policy mm -hmm. translation is taught. You're not really, you're not, we're not, um, our students aren't supported around that. So I'm going to make a pitch that that should be a central part of education for public health programs because you need to know how to move deftly between this, the policy space and the evidence based space. Um, so I spent a year appointed by President Obama as a White House Fellow, and I worked with Secretary Leon Panetta um, as his a special advisor on military mental health. And in that role, I learned a lot of things. One, I learned that the way policy happens, actually, um, it gets made, is not anywhere near what we imagine as lay people. Like, I thought that maybe there were people sitting around a table, and when an issue came up, or my evidence base was relevant, and someone says, have you read that paper by Powell and other <laughs> Let's, how about making a policy that way? That's just not how it happens. So it was a sharp um, you know, awakening that perhaps we need to do a better job at creating uh, uh, products that uh, policymakers can rapidly draw from at the key points. Like, you know, I would love for everyone to go to my you know, um, child development article and read that and translate that to policy. It's not going to happen. Um, so, so why don't we make it easier for them? So I walked away from that experience both realizing the power that lies in policy translation, because I could have a conversation with the secretary in the morning, and by the afternoon we were doing policy, um, you know, um, trend, you know, trend, um, circulation, like to really socialize the idea about introducing a policy, and by months in we would have policy um, on the table that was going to be implemented for military service men and women. I thought, okay, so this is where we need to be. And so I came back from that experience, and, and really now I'm working. Um, on policy locally as chairing the My Brother's Keeper Initiative for President Obama here, the Health Committee version of that for Durham County, and then also doing some work with the American Psychological Association's Task Force on Health Disparities and Voice Event. And I can tell you about one policy that I think would be a leveling policy that I know that there's not a lot of political will in the state of North Carolina for, um, and that's Medicaid expansion. Um, it's, uh, it is probably the one opportunity that we've had in a very long time to increase healthcare access for low-income men um, in, in our nation. Um, you have, usually, Medicaid is only available to women and children who are um, below the sort of poverty lines, but low-income men also are disproportionately pushed out of healthcare marketplaces. And even with the, the healthcare exchanges, um, Medicaid expansion, there's still people who fall in that loop, that, that if you do a Venn diagram, people who fall in that middle who are still not being reached by those um, exchanges and are uninsured and paying um, the tax associated you know, with the individual mandate um, that was before. So I think that we have to look at every opportunity that we have available to us um, to expand reach to people who are you know, not being covered. And it is an economic um, imperative, right? Because for every there was a study done by my colleague Roland Thorpe and others who showed that the amount of money related to health disparities for black males that this cost our nation is astronomical. And it's unconscionable to think that we wouldn't take an easy road to like increasing healthcare access to them. So I'm kind of on a soapbox about Medicaid expansion, especially since in the state of North Carolina, when you're in the prison system under certain circumstances, you can get Medicaid, and then and that Medicaid will follow you when you exit prison. So we can do that in that context. Why aren't we trying to expand it for folks in the community? So um, that's um, one policy I think that would be particularly relevant for the work that I do. Was a lot of those um, cases where they could were related to an app. I think it was called Grinder, and so a lot of times these people didn't even know the person's real name. But how is it? How do you recommend in terms of with education, STD, HIV prevention, with technology and social media, keeping of how do we stay ahead of the game uh, to combat things like Grinder? They didn't even know people's real names, and so trying to track and reduce uh, the civil, like, the civil, out, civil outbreak 
was very tricky because they didn't even know people's real names because they were using these apps where they were just a, a hookup app and things. So how do we com combat that those who are going to work in SOV prevention, HIV prevention, and with so many tools and things now, it's really just about these, you know, getting together, you know, names, you know, whatnot. So how, what, what are some of the strategies or your recommendations on how, 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 how do we fight that new, new, new emerging battle? I can tell you, I just left Wake County Human Services when I was sitting in the middle of that whole battle when we started to see the emerge of, you know, sickness increasing and, and seeing that when we were doing our um, disease intervention specialists, you know, going into the field and doing an investigation to see exactly, you know, who was linked to who, we all draw back to it. It wasn't just grind, it was a number of different apps. It could be Snapchat, it could be uh, Grindr, it could be Add to Add, it could be several different sites. And to uh, answer your question, how do we, you know, go about, you know, combating, you know, working in these social, you know, <coughs> media realms to, you know, do prevention? You have to use those sites. You actually have to go into those sites and have someone that is there to provide education, not to criminalize someone, not to, you know, bring them in and say, you know, you are infected so and so. No, you have to actually go and use those sites. Use that as a method of you providing education to your, you know, your colleges, and universities, to those communities that are not linked to the communities that are, you know, universities. Because a lot of times when we think about older youth, we automatically go to our colleges and universities and think that's what we need to start first. When there's really a whole world, and you know, a whole realm of individuals who are outside of that setting. So if we are going to, you know, look at you know, combating the, you know, social media and the hookups that are in those, you know, areas. Use social media to reach them. She makes a very good point. <laughs> very good point. Um, I had been doing outreach for HIV since the 1980s. And when I became a researcher with it, when we did, we did a play, uh, it was on HIV AIDS, uh, Windows or something, it was on African American relationships. And we had data indicating that young African American women who had a lot of knowledge of HIV AIDS had more reported unprotected sex and more sexual partners. I couldn't do anything today because I've been married since New Jack City. I'm coming to the city. I'm completely clueless. So I sat on the day because I could not make sense. It didn't make sense to me from a, a research standpoint that a woman has a high degree of knowledge of HIV AIDS. Why would she have more partners? And moreover, why would she continue to have unprotected sex? Okay? So then I went back to the qualitative. I didn't sit and talk to some people. I didn't sit. And after talking to them, I realized I really didn't know y'all. <laughs> so I didn't know what's going on. So then I began to say, okay, I have to take my lens off first as a researcher. Secondly, my Christian ethic has to be set to the side. And people are expressing their sexuality in difference. So this data is looking peculiar to me. <coughs> Next thing I did is I went to some, uh, someone invited me to a presentation on relationships. And it was about the DM. I don't know, I know DMV, I don't know, I don't know what they were talking about. It goes down to the DM. And there's a whole other world of sexual connection out there that most of the people my age, we don't know nothing about. And there are codes and terms and places and sexual concurrency going on. You know, where if you don't know what eggplant means, if you don't know what a peach means, and there's different things that are in. And so you're a song because you know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. So so I know that. <laughs> <laughs> it's scary. So I knew as a researcher that in order for me to stay relevant and truly understand how to address some of these diseases, in particular STDs and HIV, I had to give them to know. Does that make sense? And so I, as researchers, we have to stay as relevant as we possibly can. And stay connected to the young people. Stay connected to the people we're trying to solve the issue around. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think it goes back to like you said, it's that disconnect. If you're finding yourself as you, you know, continue to grow, you know, your field and your studies, but you find yourself, you know, further away of who you're trying to reach, <coughs> then that's an issue that you need to go back and look at. I mean, I think it harkens back to the adage that, you know, nothing without, about them without them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this notion that we show up in community or in spaces where people live, work, play, pray, and get health care, and that we come with an agenda. I and mean, even when it's not um, explicitly described. And we also bring with us our own stereotypical 
assumptions about groups. It's, we are, by nature, human beings categorized information in order to understand processing. It's a simple cognitive processing you know, dilemma, right? But in doing that, we often um, you know, make certain um, presumptions about folks that prevent us from being as uh, effective as we can be. And the strategies that my colleagues have talked about are all about doing person-centered work. I mean, making sure that, first of all, that you're not showing up um, as a missionary. Because folks don't need to be saved. I mean, it's just, if you're showing up with that energy at all, you should probably take a retreat um, um, and, and get yourself, as my, as my youth would say, get your mind right tomorrow. Right. <laughs> then come back. Um, so that you are approaching this from the right, uh, with the right energy and space. And you know, I believe that social just, health equity work is social justice work. Like, I mean, it's so important that you love the people that you work for. Radical love is needed in this space in such a way. And what you often find is apathy and, you know, um, you know, the kind of energy that says, oh, I, you know, that I pity you or, you know, you're coming with the wrong headspace. And um, what I learned in the work that I've done over the, you know, more than a decade with boys and men of color is that these are incredibly amazing, wonderful, vibrant human beings with such capability and hidden talent and, uh, you know, to help us solve these problems. But we're not utilizing them in the way that we could. We're not partnering with them um, equitably. So I just, you know, want to make sure that, you know, you get nothing else from what we're describing. I think it's just that, you know, that you have to love the people that you serve and show up with the, with the, with the compassion and desire to, to engage them at the right level. Yeah, one thing that we try to do is, um, because we have uh, different programs, uh, we have parenting classes, so we try to educate uh, the mothers, uh, because they are the, the main structure of the family. So if you want to do change in the family, just call with the mother. So uh, we try to um, bring people from different backgrounds and talk from different topics, and specifically for um, the Latino families, uh, like my parents, they never talked to me about sex. Uh, we have a lot of taboos and, and stigma with all those topics, so uh, we try to educate parents uh, to teach the kids in a different way and be more open to uh, discuss with them uh, sexuality and gender. Um, because we have a, a support group, we have uh, for the last 10 years, we have has been working with the LGBT community. So we have a support group for transgender, and we have uh, established in the community uh, a place more open to share our facilities with different people from different backgrounds and different sexual orientation and, and different <coughs> the way that they do. So, um, at the beginning, it was really very shocked for the community, and we feel the, the reject from the community. But now they are more, more open to discuss that kind of things that we say we always try to put under the table. So educating the, the moms and, and the family uh, is the best way to try to make change in all the community. So that the, the, the main thing that we try to do um, in our programs. Some of you have already addressed this, but looking back on your careers and your involvement in this health disparity work, um, do you have any particular advice or tidbit that you would give someone who's just starting out and trying to carve, you know, their niche in health disparity work? First, you've got to be able to tolerate ambiguity. That's the first thing. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to be confused a lot, and particularly when you're working with folks in medicine, science, and the community. Um, the second thing, I think, understand that one intervention won't work for all groups. You have to be open to new learning. I mean, I've learned stuff about genetic polymorphisms from the articles I have used dictionaries that are <laughs> Working with other scientists, you know, looking at biomarkers, looking at alleles, 
And so I have, you have to be open to learn and constantly educating yourself. Because I tell folks, when I started, got that grant, it was like having a postdoc. Because I had to play catch up quick, about medicine. Um, the, the, the other thing, too, is I think you have to make sure that you're always about the business of training the next group behind you. One of the things I saw the playwright do with uh, the actors, we would give them all of the articles and stuff on the issue. He would have write the script, the scientists would consult, we'd come over to do and you know, get your brain, trust me, we'll help out, thank you. <laughs> uh, but he would also take the kids around people who were affected by the disease and have them sit and talk to the person before they act. Now I ask myself, if we did that with the young people we train, we had meshed them in this experience earlier. Now, if you want to be an oncologist, you want to go over to the uh, Lindbergh Center, you want to go over to Duke, you want to work with these kids with cancer, you're going to spend some time with them. We're going to educate you on the different experimental methodologies, we're going to teach you how to write, how to collect data, but we need you to feel just a little bit so that you know exactly what you're dealing with. Does that make sense? Uh, also, I, I think making sure that your training is multidisciplinary. Multidisciplinary, meaning understanding policy, understanding economics, understanding critical race theory, understanding history. <coughs> if you're going to approach a particular disease, these disparities in health are from the womb to the tomb. You know, inadequacies in pre prenatal uh, health care. We see these inadequacies when the kids get to school and they manifest themselves in so called. <coughs> So we have to be multidisciplinary. That the, this next generation of researchers who are going to address health, because health disparities are domestic, and they are part of American culture, that you have to have people who understand the totality of it. You have to understand you know, biomedicine, you have to understand history, sociology, and make, making sure that you have a team of people around you. It was one of the, the strengths of working with the, the folks on this particular project is that I could call people in Michigan, I could come over to Duke, I could come over to Carolina, I say, okay, you know, uh, Paul hit me out. I can understand this guy. And Paul got to go help me out. So, any advice I can get to is create a team of sharp people around you in all disciplines that can make it make sense for you so you don't have to stay up all night trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I think that is such um, wonderful advice. And the only thing I would add to that is um, something that I learned, you know, my training um, at Michigan. So, I trained at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor amazing place to be trained. I can't say enough about um, all of what I learned. It's not just being um, in the space and from the curriculum, but from the mentorship. Um, and I remember um, in one particular class, one of my research methods class, um, one of the professors standing up and giving a lecture about how objectivity um, should be um, positioned in our work and how it's very important that there's a, a, a respectful distance between what we examined in our own lives, and I just, I struggled with that because I often thought that the, the, the catalyst for me, I was a first generation college graduate, um, you know, my mom has, has an eighth grade education, there were no road maps, um, and everything about why I ended up there was serendipity and grace, right, and also because I had a, a life calling, um, some folks may not, that may not speak to most, but it speaks to me. <laughs> Um, and, you know, before I even understood what health disparities was, my path to that career was being created. My grandfather passed away at age 51 from a preventable cancer. He was a single father, um, Marine, um, had his own particular way of being a man in the world, a particular masculinity that, you know, um, expressed itself as stoicism, and yet had these horrendous exposures to discrimination, including being chased out of Alabama in the middle of the night, of four, you know, um, escaping a potential lynch. So all of these histories, personal stories were sort of permeating my environment as I grew up. And I also noticed around me that people were dying from yeah. preventable conditions. And it was, you know, that personal experience, I think, helped me to have the sensitivity to the world around me, but also set up the stage for this career that I'm now occupying. And so I now believe that the best research is research. And so and I, the, 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 the advice I give to young scholars is to pay attention to those personal narratives in your lives. What moves you on any given day? Because this is front lines work, right? This is like boots on the ground. This is not work that you can come half-heartedly to. It's not um, a linear path. You're going to get a lot of setbacks. You're going to get advice to, to flee 
the, the area for in pursuit of easier science or science that's more fundable. And so you have to have some real grit in this space. And that grit can only come by accessing something deeper than a publication list and a, a you know tenure opportunity. I mean, you have to really be grounded in something more. And so I believe that most people who come to this work are called. Um, some people just show up, um, when most are called. Um, and so I think pay attention to that, right? And that it should be the, the thing that drives you. Some of my most interesting research questions have come out of conversations that I've had with men in my family about their experiences. The theory-driven work that I do comes from not theorizing simply from an existing uh, theoretical base, but you bridging that with, with common sense, wisdom, and knowledge, and understanding. And so um, the other advice I would give is to be rigorous in your work. Um, the, 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 we're not doing anybody a favor by coming to this work with, 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 um, without the rigor that it deserves. So I, you know, I, as Dr. Livingston pointed out, you have to continuously sharpen your skills. This, you'll be learning all the way through. You'll be taking classes and learning new techniques and shifting and moving with the flow of the field. So that's very, very important. And, um, and also be productive. Um, it's very easy to get into this space of, you know, not producing and not publishing because, you know, it's not a kind world. Reviewer number two is on my list of people to, to send a strongly worded book. It's always reviewer two. I know mean, who, you know, quietly asked me to leave the field and shoot cabaret instead of being an academic scholar. But, but, I, but I would say that um, you have to have a quick recovery time from those types of setbacks. So some of the most um, essential advice I got was from a colleague of mine, Irene Yen, um, at UCSF, who said, wisdom, you know, you have to reduce the recovery time. You're putting out work, but you're, as soon as you get that rejection, you're like, oh gosh, you, know, you have to call 20 people, it takes you, 20, you, know, you know, several weeks to get over it. She said, you have exactly three days to, like, to, to be in that space of like discontent, and then you need to get that paper back out the door. And you know what? When I started doing that, I started publishing exponentially. And so I'm just encouraging you to like stay true to what you believe you should be doing with your life. Because this is actually not highly paid work. Like, so you need to love it. Um, and if you're studying things just for the purpose of moving along a particular career path and you don't really feel connected to it, you're not going to last in this space. So I just say do what you love and serve the people you love. I think the only thing I would add is you know, keep the box out of the way. Don't get stuck. Yeah, the box of thinking that everything has to go a specific way. Um, I still consider myself a newbie in the field. I'm still a baby, even though you know I've been doing the work. I was actually in school and doing the work at the same time. So you know, in, in doing that, you know, I agree with everything. The table is you know have that network, work on those networks, continue to let those things grow. Um, ask for help when you don't know. If you don't know how to use something, find someone who can be your mentor. Find someone that can answer those questions that you're you know you're kind of stuck on. So, you know, that would be my mom encouragement to just keep that one. I have two little more. Two more. Two more. One, what, as you move toward uh, tenure, <coughs> as Dr. Powell indicated, it's, 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 for some, it's easy to get intellectual atrophy. We were trying to get Michigan, so we know nothing about research. We're <laughs> <laughs> such a fan, yeah. <laughs> I try to find students who are brighter than me. I try to find students who will continue to encourage me. I love reading that thesis or that dissertation. That's a new body of knowledge I get introduced to, and I can pick up quick by reading their paper. Does that make sense? So you want really bright students, and you want students who are more interested in your research than you are. And that will keep you going as you move past and you move toward a full professor. You need to, you have to stay invigorated. You don't want to ever lose that art of discovery, and that love for that art. I'm probably nerd down when I <laughs> And I think it's really easy for academicians to encourage folks to be what they are, right? You know, there's this sort of ego maniacal preoccupation with creating many versions of yourself sometimes. So excuse that. And when you hear it, like, you just, you know, I think we need people in every space of public service. Um, so if your place, your calling is in the, the academy, that's okay. If you're doing social justice work from the Hill, I'm happy you're there. If you're doing it from media and entertainment, I'm happy you're there. I just think we need more knowledgeable, well-trained, empathetic um, foot soldiers. And so it doesn't really matter to me. You know, I don't, students come to me and they work in my research lab, and I'm not particularly that um, concerned with making sure that they 
join the academy. I, I love it when they do, and I'm usually a good talent scout, and I can tell when someone has a knack for that, but I'm not going to push people away who have other desire, career desires. And I know that that disinvestment in you young scholars who are not on the path that the academy happens, even though people don't speak about it, it happens. So I just, I mean, this is not just for you guys, but for other colleagues in the, in the room, too. Just, we need to be open to the possibility of career, given how um, deeply embedded, structurally embedded, these health inequities are. And you had your hands on hand back here. Yeah. Um, just in thinking about um, being, uh, continuing this work and um, social media and um, you know, the next generation work, how do we, do we reach um, younger generations who are these individuals who believe we're in a post racial society? And, I'd say don't stand outside the window and vote go inside. So if you know where they are and what you know communities they're in, don't just stand outside and have the conversation. Actually go in and talk to them. So you know, like I said, it's just a matter of just actually going in and working with those young people, finding out where they are. If you don't know, ask some questions. It's like, hey, you have cousins, you have you know, friends, you have people that are, you know, educators that work with young people on a regular basis, work with those youth serving organizations to find out exactly, hey, have the conversation and then use them from there. Because I guarantee you they'll talk to you. And I, I love that. I'm gonna use that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I love that for a lot of reasons and most importantly because it it speaks to the idea that um, youth have a desire to know about the, those issues. They just don't know how to access the information. And we often don't present it in a way that they can access it. And then we don't engage them in the work that we're doing at an equitable level. In my house, in the most southern households, probably most houses across the U.S., there was an adult table and a little kid's table. Remember that? Right? You could not, don't dare go move to the adult table until you were invited. And we treat our, our engagements with youth and youth, youth activists the same way. You know, they have all this wisdom and understanding, but we're putting them at the little kid's table when, in fact, we need them to be at the big table so that we can include them and open the dialogue. And so I'm, I'm doing a project now in Durham um, where we're doing systematic social observations in Durham neighborhoods, and we're also using EMA technology to understand exposure duration profiling and you know the affect that follows in real time. And we have a youth advisory board. I mean, we have youth who sit with us, who help us to think about the methods we use and the implications of our work and how we're going to disseminate it in the community following the work. So I think you have to develop those strategies. And the idea of a post-racial nation, at this point in our time, with the news every day, if you're still there, I'm concerned about your well being. Um, you've got a prescription pad, you can work it out. Because it's really, I mean, you can't live in the time that we're living now and, and really utterly believe that we're post-racial. Although I know that the idea and the, um, the, the comfort that that would bring to most of us is we were post-racial, all, we all want to be there, but we're not. Um, I think that we need to have more community forums. We do a lot of community healing circles, um, you know, where people can come and talk about these issues. We need more youth-led circles. Maybe we wouldn't call them healing circles because that's not something youth would like. But <laughs> what we need to figure out ways to understand what they're struggling with in that information um, aggregation process. Like, is it that the information is alarming to them and it's upsetting to engage discussions around race? Because what it conjures up for them? Is it because they lack the fundamental knowledge of the history behind how our country has gotten to where we are? Have they entered the conversation you know, at a point where the, the, um, the past um, uh, exposures are not really discussed? I mean, as uh, my colleague mentioned, Maritza, like sometimes they, we talk about things and we push them under the table. You know, there's a silence around exposure to discrimination. I bet that if any of us have any people in our families that are living in like the 1920s, 1918s, like that post-slavery uh, period, and we asked them to tell us stories, they would have many more stories to tell us than they actually had actually shared, right? Because those stories, we don't talk about that history. And that's with all sides of this angle, not just people who were in the position to be enslaved, but folks who were actually 
part of the, the structure. Like, we don't have those open conversations because they're uncomfortable. But in fact, what we learn through those dialogues are about how people cope with it and what they actually experience. And that's actually that coping mechanism is intergenerationally transferred. So we, we just need more openness and transparency, but we have to create spaces where you feel comfortable. There can't be this disproportionate balance of power in the dialogue. Otherwise, you, I wouldn't come. I mean, I'm having myself 16 years old and someone asking me to come, you know, to participate in a process like that. If I felt marginalized, I wouldn't show up. And please for less than I have you from 85. Yeah, right. <laughs> where you're going to that nightclub that is downtown Raleigh, and you're sitting on the step at 3 a.m. and you're having a conversation with someone. So, yeah, you know, yeah. just keep those things in mind. So, yeah. yeah, we do street intercepts. Right. So, you might find if you're between the 18 and, 18 and 29, you're a black man in Durham, you might get approached by us. Right. We, we go to nightclubs, we go to car washes, we go to barber shops, we, go, we meet the men where they are. And that's, that same principle applies. I think you're, there's so much in the barber shop. Thank you so much.